I like those little dancey red and blue bars. Every time I see them, it makes me, makes me smile. It really does. I sit here next to her. She <laughs> smiles every time. How are you? Welcome to Ohio Has If Shoes. I'm Mike Polk, Jr. I'm Stephanie Haney. Thanks for being with us. If you are just joining us for the first time, this is your go-to source for your weekly info about what's going on in Ohio politics as far as we can glean from the internet and our friends and, and smart people behind <laughs> us. Yeah, we do pull it from all corners of the earth here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we've got a good show lined up for you today, an interesting show. We're going to be talking about something that has gotten uh, national attention, actually. That's from right. Right down the street. How to talk about politics when you are in the media, especially in this environment today. And that's what we're going to be discussing that. The editor of The Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com, Chris Quinn, had a very well-traveled letter from the editor talking about how The Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com covers um, this election and Trump in particular and it went viral and we're going to discuss that um, but we are also going to talk give you an update on what's going on with our Senate candidates Bernie Moreno and Sherrod Brown what they've been up to in the last week what we found and we're also going to start with some breaking news yeah this is some news fresh out yesterday afternoon there has been a second death now related to the House Bill 6 first energy bribery scandal that is Sam Randazzo he was confirmed to have been found dead yesterday afternoon 
That was in Columbus. Uh, this is the second death tied to this scandal. First was Neil Clark, who was a lobbyist. Neil Clark died by suicide before former Ohio House Speaker Larry Householder was ever even tried, before his federal trial even started. And now fast forward to today, Householder is in the middle of serving a 20-year prison sentence. Now, just a reminder, this is all over the nuclear power plant bailout. That's what House Bill 6 was all about. That First Energy admitted that it bribed officials, Householder and Rendazzo, to get passed and get special treatment on that House Bill 6 bill. And reminder, Sam Randazzo, he was the former chair of the Ohio Public Utility Commission. He was appointed by Governor Mike DeWine, and that was over the objections of a lot of people. A lot of people made it known that they were not interested in having Randazzo in that position. DeWine appointed him anyway. Consequently enough, today was the State of the State speech from Governor Mike DeWine, but did not make any mention of the death of Randazzo or anything pertaining to that. This is uh, getting closer and closer and closer to the administration, whether, you know, that's an uncomfortable thing to say, but there are a lot of, a lot of uh, loose ends here that need to be tied up and a lot of reporting that needs to be done, and this just gets deeper and deeper and just gets uglier and uglier. And just a reminder, some of House Bill 6 is still on the books. It is. Parts of it still is on the books. That includes, you know, some energy stipulations and regulations that are in there. Also, a subsidy for at least one coal plant that is in the state of Indiana. And I uh, do want to remind you as well, related to everything that we were talking about here, Sam Randazzo was under indictment. He was under federal indictment and indictment in the state of Ohio. So. He was indicted in December at the federal level. It wasn't until February that he was indicted at the state level for 22 felonies. So if you're wondering why this may have happened, you mm -hmm. know, we did know a long time ago based on what the First Energy Corporation had admitted its officials did tied to a $4.3 million bribe that he is accused of receiving. And then we don't know when it happened, but we knew that he was found yesterday late morning by Columbus police in a building that was registered to an LLC that Randazzo actually owned. And he was found hanged. He, he, he hanged himself. So it is an apparent suicide. Apparent. Yeah, it hasn't been officially ruled a suicide, but an apparent suicide there. So we did want to uh, make mention of that. That's a big story. We've been following the House Bill 6 first energy bribery scandal. Also, one important thing to note here before we move on to other things, DeWine did say recently that had he known now what he uh had he known then what he knows now he would not have appointed randazzo but there was a big stretch of time in there when he was really defending that randazzo appointment to the chair of the ohio public utility commission once again did not bring it up today at the state of the state which he offered today from the state house but a couple of things that he did bring up that i feel like we should mention he did give the state of the state today um this is from our good friend haley b miller who's been a guest here from the columbus dispatch uh Governor DeWine announced plans for a voucher program to make child care more affordable and spent $85 million in federal spending to upgrade and expand child care facilities. He urged universities to teach educators about reading programs to teach students to break down words and sounds, very education focused, mm -hmm. and launched a pilot program in 11 counties that will periodically send nurses to visit new mothers to discuss community resources and provide guidance about breastfeeding and sleep safety. He, there was a lot of concentration on early childhood care in the state of the state. Thank you to Haley B. Miller for covering that. If you want to look at it for yourself, we did stream it on the WKYC YouTube page, so you can find it there if you're interested. Not a ton of coverage on the State of the State speech today, so if you want to look at it for yourself, it is available there. There you go. Now, we should address what's going on here in Ohio, because one of the main reasons that we're doing this show is because we have a huge election in November that could determine the balance of the Senate, and that involves our two candidates, Sherrod Brown, current sitting Senator Sherrod Brown, and Bernie Moreno, the Republican candidate, and we'll give you a little update on what they've been up to this week. Not a lot. It's been a pretty slow week for them. Typical stuff from the campaigns. I'll show you what we found. From um, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown, he pushed for an extension on an internet assistance program. Uh, to get high-speed internet to rural communities. Um, he met with Ohioans in Mahoning Valley to talk about Medicare costs and his efforts to put a cap on insulin. Um, and he expressed skepticism about the $600 million Norfolk Southern settlement that just went down in East mm. Palestine. He's concerned that that might not be enough, that it might not, that some things might uh, flare up later on that we're not aware of. So essentially he's out there doing uh, what he would do normally as a senator and being very public about that, making sure people seeing that he's doing the work for Ohioans, that uh, his campaign says he's been doing this whole time, and that is his strength, they say, and that's why they should, that's, that's their, his selling point. He was also endorsed by Communications Workers of America, which is the largest communications and media 
labor union in the U.S. Okay. okay. I will say, too, regarding that East Palestine settlement, that is something interesting to think about, too, because when you settle, you waive future claims. Mm. And when we've seen other kinds of uh, lawsuits happen from these sort of disasters that have happened, usually we're looking at something like years and years down the road. Usually, you know, if you're looking at like an Erin Brockovich situation, right, she stumbled upon that. She's like, why is everybody getting sick? Thank you for making it relatable to me and the <laughs> by, by referencing the Pelican Brief, because otherwise I wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Go ahead. So why is everyone getting sick? So why is everyone getting sick, you know, like years and years after the fact, when you find out there's something tainted or whatever? It's interesting to think about Norfolk Southern kind of getting ahead of this now with this settlement because mm -hmm. we do not know what is to come. In other in words, the it, the, the, his, uh, Sherry Brown's concern and some other people's skeptics' concerns might be that if we get out in front of this now, settle this quickly, then maybe if there's some stuff down the road that we would have to atone for, we could clear the clear the table. For and hopefully there isn't. You know, yeah. nothing would be a better situation, I think, for these people if they're compensated for the horrible situation that mm -hmm. they were put through. Norfolk Southern takes some measures to make sure these kind of things don't happen again. But you never know what will happen in the long term. So that is something that everybody should know when you're entering into a settlement. There's a little bit of risk there. There's risk on both sides, which is why settlements happen. And Senator Brown has expressed that concern as well. Now, uh, uh, Bernie Moreno this week, um, he also received an endorsement. His endorsement was from Arkansas Republican Senator Tom Cotton. Maybe not a big surprise there that a Republican senator uh, from Arkansas would endorse the Republican running in Ohio. But he called uh, Moreno a businessman, a job creator, and a strong conservative leader. Um, uh, Moreno also released a statement today condemning the national economic numbers that were released today showing a rise in persistent inflation. And his campaign said, quote, thanks to Joe Biden's reckless spending authorized by Democrats like Sherrod Brown, inflation is crushing hardworking Americans. And then finally, um, he, oh, we should address this, obviously, is that he's, he's a bit of a trickier situation right now because of uh, Trump's announcement on Monday that abortion policy policy should be decided by the states. We've all been kind of waiting for him to see where he's going to land on this because it is such a touchy issue and it's so important across the country right now with voters. Uh, he told reporters on Wednesday, uh, the former president, that he would not sign a federal ban into law if elected. Now, he's been kind of dancing back and forth with this, and um, now he's finally come down on something, and people like uh, Bernie Moreno have to have to come to terms with this now because they've said things prior to this that might conflict with things they've said uh, that, that President Trump is saying now. Yes, he did very publicly say on the primary trail that he would be in support of a federal ban mm -hmm. for abortion. That's right. Back in uh, March, he said he would support federal restrictions on abortions past 15 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, and in a 2021 interview with Breitbart, he described himself as a 100% pro-life with no exceptions. Uh, in fairness, that is him talking about how he feels personally. Mm -hmm. And that is not him saying that he thinks this necessarily should be, this is the policy for the state. He, they, when asked how he feels it should be, that's what he says. And so to be fair to him, uh, that is, uh, you know, maybe how he feels personally is not how he feels it should be uh, handled at legally. In that national ban that he yes. would support. So we don't necessarily know if a national ban that he supported would include no exceptions or if it might include other exceptions. But it will still be interesting watching them walk that line moving forward and see how they negotiate that. Um, because it is, uh, you know, Ohio just had a big election here where we made a pretty strong uh, case in, er, in se was September? November. Uh, November. November. And uh, came down on the side of uh, pro-choice. And so watching how they try to negotiate, that's going to be interesting moving forward. Yeah, it's in the Constitution. It's guaranteed in the Constitution here in Ohio. So um, that would be a big change if there were a federal ban put in place. That would be a change of, you know, uh, about seven weeks of access to abortion because it's viability, which can be around the 21, 22 kind of week mark post conception. That's what the medical professionals say about it. So that is a... Uh Interesting point of contention there. Donald indeed. Trump definitely throwing a wrench in things for some people out there who have said some pretty specific things about their stance on abortion. And, they, and uh, he has some very strong, strong-willed and adamant supporters. He who does. Get very, uh, who are very passionate about their candidate, Donald Trump. And our own editor of The Plain Dealer in Cleveland.com had something to say about that just this past week, about how he is planning on, and they are planning on moving forward with their coverage of Trump. Yeah, it's a, they talked about kind of the difficulty of reporting on President Donald Trump. So let's first explain who Chris Quinn is. He is, as Mike just mentioned, he is the editor of The Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com. 
He's worked in the news for four decades. Thir uh, 30 of those years have been here in the Northeast Ohio area. He's a host of a podcast today in Ohio. Mm -hmm. I, great, great podcast. Listen to it. Good, good little uh, way to learn what's going on in the state early in the morning. Monday through Friday, kind of a little capsule of what's going on there. And By early in the morning, I mean like 10, 30, <laughs> my early in the morning, not yours. Morning is early, it's whether early. it's 11.59 a.m. or 5.59 a.m., in my opinion. Agreed. Uh, so he wrote this letter from the editor. First, we want to show you, though, this article that he posted in response to that letter from the editor. So this kind of talked about the reaction that he got to it, which is why we're talking about that letter from the editor today. So he mentioned in this response to it that usually he'll put out his letter from the editor. He'll get maybe a few dozen, maybe a hundred emails. Mm -hmm. It was a much more significant response this yes, time. Yes, quite stark. That's true. Yeah, there were uh, more than 2,700 emails, he said, and counting. Now, that was at the time that this article was published, which was a little while ago now, so he may have gotten many, many more. Actually, we reached out to him, and we wanted to chat with him about the article on our show today, but uh, time constraints, you know, he is an incredibly busy person, and especially after the attention that this has gotten. So we weren't able to talk to him today, but we did let him know we were going to be sharing that article. He said he got... Thanks and kudos from across the globe, from New Zealand, Croatia, Ireland, Spain, from most of the 50 states. And a lot of people were giving a lot of kudos to the way Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer run their newsroom. Some of those places here in the United States, Nicole Wallace mentioned his letter from the editor on MSNBC. They talked about it. CNN's Casey Hunt talked with him about it. MSNBC's Morning Joe also talked about it. They read a lot of it out yeah. loud. Now, why is this interesting? The interesting thing is it's local media. It's the newspaper. People don't pay attention to this stuff. We just ignore it, right? It's interesting anytime something like this catches on, and it tells you that there's a mood for something. There is a vibe that uh, people are following, and so this caught on. So why did it catch on? Why, why did this particular message uh, connect with so many people, not just in Ohio, but across the world. Well, we're going to share it with you now, and then uh, we'll read it to you, and then we'll have some thoughts afterwards. All right, so here is the letter from the editor in full. The headline reads, Our Trump reporting upsets some readers, but there aren't two sides to the facts. Letter from the editor. A more than occasional arrival in the email these days is a question expressed two ways, one with dripping condescension and the other with courtesy. Why don't our opinion platforms treat Donald Trump and other politicians exactly the same way? Some phrase it differently, asking why we demean the former president's supporters in describing his behavior as monstrous, insurrectionist, and authoritarian. I feel for those who write. They believe in Trump and want their local news source to recognize what they see in him. The angry writers denounce me for ignoring what they call the Biden family crime syndicate and criminality far beyond that of Trump. They quote news sources of no credibility as proof the mainstream media ignores evidence that Biden, not Trump, is the criminal dictator. The courteous writers don't go down that road. They politely ask how we can discount the passions and beliefs of the many people who believe in Trump. This is a tough column to write because I don't want to demean or insult those who write me in good faith. I've started it a half dozen times since November but turn to other topics each time because this needle is hard to thread. No matter how I present it, I'll offend some thoughtful, decent people. The North Star here is truth. We tell the truth, even when it offends some of the people who pay us for information. The truth is that Donald Trump undermined faith in our elections in his false bid to retain the presidency. He sparked an insurrection intended to overthrow our government and keep himself in power. No president in our history has done worse. This is not subjective. We all saw it. Plenty of leaders today try to convince the masses we did not see what we saw, but our eyes don't deceive. If leaders began a years-long campaign today to convince us that the Baltimore Bridge did not collapse Tuesday morning, would you ever believe them? Trust your eyes. Trump, on January 6th, launched the most serious threat to our system of government since the Civil War. You know that. You saw it. The facts involving Trump are crystal clear. And as news people, we cannot pretend otherwise, as unpopular as that might be with a segment of our readers. There aren't two sides to facts. People who say the Earth is flat don't get space on our platforms. If that offends them, so be it. As for those who equate Trump and Joe Biden, that's false equivalency. Biden has done nothing remotely close to the egregious anti-American acts of Trump. We can debate the success and mindset of our current president, as we have about most presidents in our lifetimes, but Biden was never a threat to our democracy. 
Trump is. He is unique among all American presidents for his efforts to keep power at any cost. Personally, I find it hard to understand how Americans who take pride in our system of government support Trump. All those soldiers who died in World War II were fighting against the kind of regime Trump wants to create on our soil. How do they not see it? The March 25th edition of the New Yorker magazine offers some insight. It includes a detailed review of a new book about Adolf Hitler focused on the year 1932. It's called Takeover, Hitler's Final Rise to Power, and it's by historian Timothy W. Ryback. It explains how German leaders, including some in the media, thought they could use Hitler as a means to get power for themselves and were willing to look past his obvious deficiencies to get where they wanted. In tolerating and using Hitler as a means to an end, they helped create the monstrous dictator responsible for millions of deaths. How are those German leaders different from the people in Congress saying the election was stolen or that January 6th was not an insurrection aimed at destroying our government? They know the truth, but they deny it. They see Trump as a means to an end, power for themselves and their team, even if it means repeatedly telling lies. Sadly, many believe the lies. They trust people in authority without questioning the obvious discrepancies or relying on their own eyes. These are the people who take offense to the truths we tell about Trump. No one in our newsroom gets up in the morning wanting to make a segment of readers feel bad. No one seeks to demean anyone. We understand what a privilege it is to be welcomed into the lives of the millions of people who visit our platforms each month for news, sports, and entertainment, but our duty is to the truth. Our nation does seem to be slipping down the same slide that Germany did in the 1930s. Maybe the collapse of government in the hands of a madman is inevitable, given how the media landscape has been corrupted by partisans as it was in 1930s Germany. I hope not. In our newsroom, we'll do our part. Much as it offends some who read us, we will continue to tell the truth about Trump. You can send mail to him at cquinn at cleveland.com. And he says at the end there, thanks for reading. Which is his sign-off on each of his letters from the editor. So, true, false, hyperbolic, understated? I don't know. It's up to everybody's own subjective opinion, I suppose. But there have been lots of opinions about it, as we've said. It really did strike a nerve, apparently. And we're going to talk to some people about it. Yes, we do. We have two guests who will be joining us here shortly, two Republicans. We have former Cuyahoga County Commissioner Lee Weingart, who will be joining us in just a moment. And then we also have Swing State Strategies Vice President Jordan Oler. He'll be with us after that. Each of us, them will give us their individual take as Republicans in reaction to the letter from the editor. Stay tuned for that when Ohio Has Issues returns.
All right, well, enough of our yammering. You don't care what we media types have to say. We have an actual heavy hitter in here now, Republican and former Co Cuyahoga County Commissioner Lee Weingart. Thanks for joining us, sir. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here again Appreciate tonight. It. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, thanks for coming and making some sense of this with us. You heard the letter. Let's just get out of the gate with it. Um, initial response to Chris Quinn's letter from the editor. So let me frame it first. So uh, unlike most Republicans, I don't think the plain dealer Cleveland.com has a liberal bias. Okay. Uh, they endorse Republicans all the time, mm -hmm. statewide races. Uh, from my own campaign for county executive two years ago, I felt I got fair treatment from Chris Quinn, the plain dealer, so I have no ax to grind there. Uh, I would say the editor letter, uh, the first half of it was defendable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you can believe that Donald Trump has caused us to doubt elections in America after the 2020 election. You can believe that he instigated or somehow supported the January 6th uprising and insurrection in Washington, D.C. Where I draw the line is any comparison to Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. There's no American politician, uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, uh, in the history of America or in the world that comes close to Adolf Hitler, who killed 6 million Jews and started a war that killed 50 million people. Mm -hmm. So I think when you jump to Hitler, you're sort of you know, jumping the shark, as it were, and you lose all credibility at that point in my eyes. So I don't know why he felt he had to do that. I thought the first half of the article made sense. Um, it was defendable, mm -hmm. but I think any comparison to Hitler is indefensible. Okay. I will say, in fairness, uh Right. There's no one's. I don't think. I don't think Chris Quinn or anybody was claiming that his actions were comparable to Hitler. As far as he wasn't like he's just like Hitler. He killed. He might kill six million people if he gets back in office. I do think he was talking about sort of the laissez-faire attitude that people had during his rise to power. The way that we looked the other way during um, uh, and uh, during through past some of his lies. I, do you think that there can't be any helpful illustration from the history with Germany and World War II that we, so we can just never reference it? Or? So I, I think it's sleight of hand. It's, um, you're bringing in Hitler to say you know, that um, Trump is using the same styles and same techniques that Hitler did, mm -hmm. and that's what that article that sure. Quinn references says. But when you jump to Hitler, and I don't care if you're saying it's, he is Hitler, he acts like Hitler, he looks like Hitler, mm -hmm. that to me is illegitimate. Um, and so, yeah, do some of Trump's followers have the sort of strongman theory they want to see a strongman president? Yes, but that's not unusual in American history. Right. We it, rallied around a strongman, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, during uh, the Depression. True. So uh, I don't know that because you think executive power is important and that a strong president is important, equates you necessarily to being a Nazi. It's also not unusual for someone to make this comparison. People have been uh, making a, the Trump to Hitler awkward comparison throughout his entire, like you've heard it in lots of editorials, you've seen it in lots of media. My question is, why did this one resonate? Why did this one travel around so much as opposed to other ones? So when I've seen it, it's been on Facebook. Typically it's Trump or Biden. I've seen both compared to Hitler. Everything's on Facebook. On, on Facebook, right? right? Or, or on Instagram. I think it's because the editor of The Plain Dealer made that comparison uh, between Trump and Hitler. So you think the so, Hitler comparison is the reason this took off? Oh, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, when you, again, when you raise that specter of Adolf Hitler, and even if you're just sort of comparing the techniques or the way things, you know, became mm -hmm. uh, into being, you, you've lost credibility to me. And, and Chris Quinn's a great writer, and he runs a good newspaper, and I have no beef other than what this article was, and I understand that he's not a fan of Donald Trump. Right. I get that. But I think he could have made the argument in a more cogent, more reasonable way without jumping the shark to so Adolf Hitler. So if he extricated that Hitler part from it, the, you don't think the article would have had the same uh, resonance? I don't think so. I mean, I think, look, there are multiple views on the election in 2020. Trump supporters think he did nothing wrong. Trump detractors think he undermined confidence in the election. There are multiple views. And in fact, there's a court case on the mm -hmm. January 6th insurrection. And we'll see if Trump is held uh, liable for what happened. But you could certainly argue that in the bill to January 6th, and on the day of January 6th, he contributed at, at some level to what happened. I mean, Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the House, that day put some right. of the blame at Donald Trump's feet. So it's not... That changed pretty quickly. He did, it did. But Mitch it's not, McConnell so, did, too. That changed no, of course, quickly. it did, it did. But it's not unreasonable to say he's associated with both undermining confidence in elections and the January 6th insurrection. It seems, though, that the elemental thing about this article was about truth and the struggle to both represent a large portion of our uh, community and Ohio voters, but at the same time having an allegiance to that truth. Can you sympathize with the position that uh, media is in in that way? 
Oh, I do. I, I think, I mean, look, I think truth is the ultimate uh, arbiter of what the news should be. And I, and I think The Plain Dealer does a great job of printing the truth. And again, I, I'm a fan of Cleveland.com and of The Plain Dealer. But, um, you know, the way you parse truth these days, you know, is Joe Biden lying? Is Donald Trump lying? Is somebody else lying? Unfortunately, I, think that's, I do think that's slippery because th he does bring up specific instances. You're right. Anybody can say, I think Joe Biden's a jerk. I think Donald Trump's a jerk. And neither of them are wrong. That's subjective. Right. But what, when, he, when they start complaining is when you say, this guy didn't win an election and this guy did win an election. That is something demonstrable, very e provable, and that has been proven in court by the, uh, and by various other entities, obviously, through investigation after investigation. He, you, you acknowledge that Joe Biden won the election. Of course, in 2020, Now, of course. you say that, of yes. course, in 2020, but you say that so flippantly as if, as if it's out of, out of the realm of possibility that Republicans might b believe otherwise. But right. you know that there is a huge a portion of the Republican right. Party right. that does not accept that. Yeah. So how do you talk to those people and still serve them? Right, so I suspect Donald Trump knows he lost in 2020. I suspect he knows that very well. He was told by many people, 55 court cases told him that he lost. This is just a device to rile up the base and get elected president in 2024. So, you know, Trump is an actor. Mm -hmm. He's an entertainer. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a politician. Right. And so he uses all the levers he can to get the public behind him and win in 2024. Right. We, but we have to have voices that represent uh, our constituents. We have to represent Ohio properly. But we can have, of course, we'd love to have you on here. You give us an insight you, as a Republican and say this is what people are thinking. But is it? wrong for us to have somebody on or another Republican or a Democrat for that matter who just comes up with complete nonsense and then bring them on and have them represent their party in, in other facets or is the fact that they won't acknowledge reality in some way is that disqualifying I think not uh, acknowledging reality can be disqualifying uh, we there has to be some agreed truth or we can't move forward on uh, elections or in a society for that matter right but I just I discount what Donald Trump says because I know the motivation. The motivation is I want to win in 2024 and I'm going to say whatever it takes to get elected in 2024. Now you know that, but you are a learned pol former politician, someone who's very tapped in, an educated person. Not everybody is as savvy. So is it irresponsible to platform or for Chris Quinn or anybody or the plain dealer or Cleveland.com or Columbus Dispatch or anybody to platform people who won't acknowledge reality in their papers, even if uh, they're aware that what they're saying is nonsense, because could that have a negative effect on the on their viewers in Ohio? It could. Readers? It could. Look, I would say in 2016, the media elected Donald Trump president of the United States. He got more earned media for the tweets that he put out that were then put on the news that then sold advertising around mm -hmm. the eyeballs, you know, reading those tweets on the news. So the media kind of has it both ways, right? They don't like Donald Trump for what he is, right. but they like him for what he does. He brings eyeballs to the, to the TV or eyeballs to the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of betwixt and between on this. They, they don't cover him at their peril. If they don't cover Donald Trump, people will stop watching TV, right. they'll, stop wa they'll stop reading the newspaper. So. I don't envy the position that Chris Quinn is in or the, the uh, producer of Channel 3 is in. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. Um, the American people want to see Donald Trump. They want to see Joe Biden. Right. They want to see an election in 2024. So this is a business. The plain dealer's a business. Cleveland Commons is a business. So you have to make these decisions. Is it, are we doing this for economic purposes? Are we doing it for the better of society? What's our goal here? Right. What's our role? And right. everyone's trying to figure that right. out. Right. And of course, you have editorial and news. And so right. what Chris Quinn put out was an editorial, sure. his view. And then his newsroom covers the news. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to rely on your reporters to be able to discern and distill the truth and write articles that reflect the truth. And then you leave it up to your editorial board and your editorialists to comment on the truth. So we have, uh, if we have a guest coming on that denies that Joe Biden won the election, you think it's okay to put them on TV even if they won't acknowledge that? So I don't know if it's okay or not okay. It's just the reality that they may get on television because mm -hmm. there's a big segment of America, and the Republican Party at least, that thinks that Donald Trump won in 2020. So you, do you overall agree with Chris Quinn's position and the Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com's position to not platform people who won't acknowledge the results, the true results of the 2020 election? I do. You do agree I, with that? I absolutely agree with that. I think not giving a platform to somebody who is detached from reality mm -hmm who is uh, not telling the truth 
is good policy. Okay. Where I draw the line, as I said at the beginning of this interview, is any comparison to Adolf Hitler. I just right. don't think it gets you anywhere, and you lose credibility. Even the, the, you know, the, the youngest person, the person who spent the little time in school, knows Adolf Hitler, knows mm -hmm. what he did and how evil he was. And so to equate anybody, even if you're equating it because you know, Hitler told the big lie enough that people began to believe it, and you can say that Trump is engaging in sort of a big lie theory on the 2020 election, but that's where the similarity stops, I guess, is big lie. And you can't, and you just can't use, in my estimation, you cannot use comparison to Adolf Hitler and still maintain credibility. Final thing I'll ask you, did say that you sympathize with Chris Quinn's position, editors of all these papers. What's your advice to them that if they're trying to reach people who currently are not accepting the results of the 2020 election? People who are mad, people who are mad that they feel like their views and uh, of their support for Trump isn't being represented in media. How do you recommend that they reach out to those people, make them, maybe not make amends, but at least accommodate them, make them feel heard? Well, I think it's difficult to reach out to many because they don't read The Plain Dealer or Cleveland.com or right. watch mainstream television like CNN. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to reach them in that respect. Um, I think you just, you cover the election as, as best you know how to do and you let the chips fall where they may. You may not reach every reader, every voter, every American, but you have to do what you think is right. If you think it's right to only cover those who are telling the truth on a platform, I think that's your responsibility as the editor or reporter uh, in the media. And is it a legitimate gripe by Trump supporters that they are not being represented fairly in their minds in the plain dealer in Cleveland.com or no? I don't think it's a legitimate gripe, okay. no. I mean, I think their view of the plain dealer, Cleveland.com, media in general, is liberal bias mm -hmm. no matter what uh, they submit in terms of letters to the editor or what they want to see. They're never going to see it because of the bias. As I said, I don't believe in the bias um, of Chris Quinn or of the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Um, so, you know, you just may not reach everybody. The reality is we have, we've segmented our lives, particularly when it comes to how we get our news, mm -hmm. and you just may not reach those people. One last thing, and this is too big to end on, but I'm going to do it anyways because it just came to my head. We've seen people undermining institutions, particularly that the Republican Party for a long time, saying, don't trust the government, don't trust media, don't trust academia, don't trust anybody. Is this the long tail result of that finally coming to fruition? Oh, I, I think the undermining of society, um, yeah, we are seeing the, maybe the conclusion, the results of that. There's also the conspiracy theories out there. You know, there's a lot of conspiracy theorists these days. And so it kind of comes together where you're undermining established institutions and you're playing into conspiracy theory fears and then you get something like this. Well, and now it's for all of us to deal with. And we're lucky to have you here to help us sort well, it thanks, out. Thanks, Mike. And we're lucky to have, honestly, we're lucky, we, we do appreciate it. I know these are trying times. We'll be here for a lighter one next time, I promise. We got a whole uh, long march until November. Uh, by the way, any, you noticing anything I should say in the Senate race here? Anything that I didn't other than things at the time? In the Senate race? Yeah. Uh, so I think the Senate race becomes interesting if Joe Biden is not on the ballot in Ohio. Oh, yeah, I saw that. I mean, that, that. becomes, you know, if, uh, and this is the Democratic party's fault entirely. They knew when Ohio's deadline was. Republicans Just had... Just real quick, yeah. um, technically Joe Biden is not on the Ohio ballot right now due to a technicality and oversight on the Democrats. Has happened before, has been remedied before right. without any pushback, but... but by both parties. So by both parties. It, so, so, well, so it was in 2012, both parties had their nominee conventions after mm -hmm. the Ohio deadline, right. and so the General Assembly let them both on. This time, the Republicans right. have their nominating convention before the Ohio deadline. Right. Democrats are long after, nine or ten days afterwards. Right. So, so it's different this time because only one party screwed up as opposed to both, and one party has the, party, or has the power to uh, screw up the other party. Politics 101. That is true. <laughs> okay, so that's true, though. That could make an effect, but Joe Biden will be on the That's not going to happen. Joe Biden's going to be on the ballot. He, this place is, come so on. you say. All right. So we'll you see. say. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. Words. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. Weingart. Uh, we'll see you again Thanks, soon. Mike. Appreciate yep. it. Thanks for making yep. this all smarter. Of course. Stay Thank tuned. War Ohio has issues next.
Hello everybody, welcome back to Ohio Has Issues. I'm Stephanie Haney. If you've been with us, you know that we're discussing a letter from the editor that Cleveland.com's editor Chris Quinn published a couple weeks ago now. It has gotten a lot of traction and people have been sharing it and talking about it and responding to it. Thousands of people responding to the inbox. It's gotten national media attention. So Mike Polk, my lovely co-host, he just had a conversation with Lee Weingart, former Cuyahoga County Commissioner and also a Republican to get his take on it. Now we're gonna welcome in our second guest. So now we'll say hello to Jordan Oler, who is the Vice President of Swing State Strategies, also a Republican. Jordan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Stephanie, I appreciate it. Now, Jordan, I wanna ask you, um, you know, we asked you to read the letter from Chris Quinn. My first question for you, actually, I'd like to ask you is, were you aware of this before we reached out to you? Is this something that had been resonating in your circles? Uh, it actually hadn't. I mean, given the, some of the news you mentioned earlier, uh, that's been kind of dominating the news here in Columbus. So we had not, I had not seen this letter yet, uh, but I got a chance to look at it today. And uh, obviously it's without surprise that I was pretty disappointed to see the content inside. And, but I can definitely see why it was viral and why I got so much response. Okay, and I'll ask you as we get started here, if you don't mind sharing, would you yourself identify as a supporter of the former president, Donald Trump? I will be voting yes for Donald Trump this November, no question. And I want to just get to some of the basic tenets of the article, but um, well, given your initial response to it, I guess first I'll ask you, what was it about it that you found disappointing in the letter from the editor? Uh, Stephanie, it's, I think it's sad to see how far journalism has fallen. I didn't think there was much of a bias at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, much like the former commissioner mentioned, until I saw this letter personally. Um, I've been in politics long enough to remember when the left was calling uh, George W. Bush Hitler uh, back in 2004 when I worked for him. Um, and back then, that kind of lowbrow comparison to Hitler uh, was rejected by more fair minds and newsrooms. So it's sad to see that that's now become the norm uh, from the editor of The Plain Dealer. I mean, criticism of Donald Trump is very fair. That's the job of responsible media. But only Hitler is Hitler, and to say otherwise is just extreme and inappropriate. Now, I don't know if you had an opportunity to listen along to our previous conversation. That was something that was raised in the previous conversation, was maybe being of the mind that that Hitler comparison is what gave this such legs. Now, I know you said you weren't aware of it in your circles before we brought it to your attention, but Reading it now, how do you feel about that? Well, it certainly seemed that's what he was going for, his shock value, which again was surprising given the tone and, and temper you'd expect from the plain dealer, especially the editor. I don't know the man. I'm sure he's a good and decent person, but I think uh, he made a really poor choice in words here. Um, like I said, only Hitler is Hitler. Um, you might see over my left shoulder here, my grandfather's medals are on the wall. It's somebody, somebody that he's my hero. And uh, he bayoneted Nazis on the front lines of Germany for three years. And um, just to, to, to make that kind of comparison uh, in a presidential election for people who you know, have lost relatives in World War II, uh, uh, you know, lost uh, relatives in, in the Holocaust, certainly the six million um, Jews who were slaughtered by Nazism deserve better than to have uh, their American election compared to um, you know, Hitler's Germany. I'll ask you now, in the follow-up article, and in a third follow-up, well, a second follow-up, a third article from Chris Quinn, he had referenced a lot of communication he had gotten from veterans who had said they were fighting for uh, a certain freedom in America, they were fighting for democracy, and really did seem to kind of resonate with them when he mentioned the people who had fought in World War II. So you're saying that doesn't resonate with you at all as someone who has veterans in his lineage? Not in the least. Like I said, it's wildly inappropriate to call your political opponents that. Um, these kind of extreme comparisons are so damaging because they dehumanize your political opponents. That's actually the first goose step into fascism, is when you make your opponents not human anymore, you make them monsters. That's what Nazis are. So that's why the comparison from Trump supporters or Trump himself to Hitler is so wildly inappropriate. You're not alone there in that perspective. Certainly a lot of people took issue with that comparison, kind of parsing what Chris Quinn had said there, not necessarily comparing it directly to the horrific, horrific actions of Adolf Hitler, but 
talking about the beginning steps in the early 1930s where he was able to garner support from people in the media, other people in power. Let me ask you this. As a Trump supporter, do you acknowledge that the results of the 2020 election were legitimate? Oh, 100%. I think we know that Joe Biden is president. We can see it in, in the economic numbers in front of us today. Um, I have to disagree with some of the commentary that happened earlier. However, I do appreciate, you know, the, the, the two sides you're presenting tonight. I don't want, think Chris would, should get a pass on this. He directly made a comparison to Hitler. Uh, he wasn't trying to compare processes. He was going for shock value on purpose. And it's reached a new, lo new low now. And like I said, that's the actual dangerous part of this process is when the media starts dehumanizing political opponents for the other side. We do enough job of causing enough tension. Um, it, it's on us as political consultants, candidates, uh, journalists to raise the bar for political communication. And, and this certainly did not do that. Well, we definitely appreciate your perspective on this. Absolutely. And thank you for bringing it and sharing it with us here. That's why we wanted to do this. We wanted to speak, you know, with as many sides of the issue as we possibly can. Let me ask you this. Some of the other things that were mentioned in the article, wholeheartedly appreciate, understand, hearing what you're saying about just completely not being on board with the Hitler reference. What is your comment about some of the other things that were referenced in the article? For example, January 6th, do you acknowledge or agree with the characterization that that was in fact an insurrection aimed at destroying our government? I think a lot of people on January 6th made a lot of bad decisions, but for the left to continually call this a 9-11 style event, again, it's just ridiculous and, and demeans the, the, you know, the honor that should be bestowed upon those, those moments in our history. Um, you know, January 6th was, was a, a ridiculous uh, display by a, half, by a bunch of rednecks and Trump voters that, that really just you know, demean the whole process and undermine what Donald Trump was fighting for. Um, you know, he certainly made some bad decisions that day, but we're moving on. And now Biden is president. We need to be talking about the state of our economy right now, um, the state of our border, and I think that's where voters are right now, which is why younger voters, women, African-Americans, you know, more strong coalitions of Democrat voters are leaving Joe Biden in droves. So whatever happened four years ago is irrelevant now to the economy that is just not working for people and it's falling apart underneath our feet. Uh, younger voters know it. They've been locked out of the economy. They can't find housing. They can't find jobs that pay. Uh, the banks own everything. They're feeling cut out by a big government that is not on their side anymore. And that's where, you know, that's what this race should be about. We should be comparing Joe Biden's presidency to Donald Trump's presidency. We should be comparing Joe Biden's parenting with the people in his house to President Trump's parenting with the people in his house and how his sons uh, approach business deals with regard to their father. These are appropriate things to be talking about in an election, like we, we said earlier, and we've, I've hammered home more than enough tonight. A Hitler comparison is wildly unfair. Do you think there's room in the coverage for this election for a continuing conversation so that people do understand? Because there are a lot of people who are supporting the former president who do not believe the 2020 election was legitimate. There are a lot of people who do not believe it was a terrible thing that happened on January 6th. Do you think there's room for that in the coverage of this election? Or do you think the media is doing a bad job there? I think the media is doing a bad job of covering what is not important. Um, January 6th happened, uh, you know, uh, years ago uh, during COVID, and a lot of other things have happened during our during our uh, our time under Joe Biden's presidency, and it it it, it, it shocks me to, to watch you know the continued coverage of a bunch of dummies making some really bad choices um, uh, in comparison to a world on fire right now. We are continuing to pump dollars into Ukraine. Russia is on the march. They're as aggressive as ever. Um, Israel is at war and it's getting worse by the day. Joe Biden pulled out of Afghanistan and dishonored our troops and dishonored our efforts there. Um, these are much grander conversations that need to be happening in America right now instead of looking back at January 6th. And like I said, the rednecks who made a lot of bad decisions that day. When we do talk about, I want to revisit the comparison that was made again uh, just one more time before we wrap up our conversation here. The comparison that was made, of course, to Adolf Hitler. The former president did say that he would be a dictator on day one if reelected. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not really familiar with that comment. Um, you know, that's certainly not what anybody uh, expects of Donald Trump and not who he was four years ago. 
do you remember who he was? I think Americans, while we have short memories, do remember that times were better, that our biggest problems was, you know, the media complaining about Donald Trump's tweets. However, the world was at peace. Uh, Russia was put in the corner where they, they belong, and the economy was much stronger back then. Okay. Jordan, I want to thank you again for taking time to share your perspective with us, taking a look at that letter and sharing your reaction here on Ohio Has Issues. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for this conversation. It was great. Absolutely. Appreciate the conversation. Okay. Stick around, everyone. We'll be back in just a minute to wrap things up here on Ohio Has Issues.